In the early 2000s, China had absolutely no high-speed rail just 20 years later and China has built what is potentially the world's most impressive railway network to date with over 25,000 miles of high-speed rail. But how did they do it so quickly? How good exactly is it? And should other countries follow their model? There are both huge positives and a lot of negatives to the Chinese high-speed rail network. So let's take a look at this ambitious mega project. The Chinese high-speed rail network is run exclusively by state-owned operators and funded by a combination of government revenue and debt. This system has been both a blessing and a curse for the network their government-owned. System allows them to raise money quickly built without restrictions from other government agencies, some of which have led to the human rights concerns and environmental concerns. An overall added efficiency to the project, it also allows them easy access to the Chinese workforce. However, this plan of quickly raising debt has led to an impending disaster post-pandemic. Unless something changes as the network still aims to expand up to 30 zero miles by 2025, their debt had been piling up. It has now reached over $882 billion, which is almost 5% of China's GDP. The Chinese did not invent high-speed rail, but boy have they adopted the idea and run with it. This is Mark Smith, otherwise known as the man in seat 61. He runs one of the internet's most popular train blocks, so he rides a lot of them, like a lot. They are now streaks ahead of any other high-speed operator in terms of the network they've built. It's incredibly well organized. Everyone on the high-speed network has their own reserved seat. They've got all the boarding processes down. Today, you can get from Beijing to Shanghai, a distance of 1300 km in just four hours. You can go from north to south from Beijing to Guangzhou in eight hours instead of 22 on a regular train. And if you really wanted to, you could take a bullet train to Tibet at 3000 meters above sea level with automated oxygen supply and tinted windows. You don't get sunburned at such a high altitude. So how was all of this even possible? Well, firstly, because they could do it for a bargain price. In China, a kilometer of high-speed track costs 1721 million USD. In Europe, that price tag is 2539 million USD. China's infrastructure boom was and is a matter of political will, but also the ability to mobilize massive amounts of cheap labor, which is connected to cheap materials. This is Cecilia Han Springer, who does research into the environmental impact of China's infrastructure policy making. They take a massive amount of steel and aluminum and other really carbon intensive materials, which are sourced from domestic producers. And using domestic producers, of course, boost the economy. By the 2008 Beijing Olympics, China had already opened its first high speed line from Beijing to Tianjin that ran at 350 km se. They started with the 4x4 network so four north to south and four east to west, and that was around 2004. David Feng is an independent researcher specializing in China's high-speed rail network. Though he's currently sitting in a car, he's probably taken even more trains than Mark Smith. Then to deal with the financial crisis in the late 2000s, the idea was they would extend parts of the 4x4 network. And then afterwards, around the mid-2010s, they were like, wait, this isn't going to be enough. We need to double the whole network. It's gonna be eight by eight, not four by four, except to do that. You also have to move a lot of people out of the way. China has been swift and ruthless about relocating residents. And if you don't wanna move, well, they'll just build around you until you do. But it's not just people you have to move. Germany's Stuttgart rail station, for example, has been planned since 1995, but is nowhere near done. It's faced endless budget and planning problems, including blizzards. In 2017, the delayed project was further derailed when Duke Shaban claimed it would have to resettle endangered lizards at a cost of 15 million euros. That's a budget of two to 4,000 euros per lizard, not in China. The Chinese legal code allows basically the authorities to basically, China doesn't have that issue because they can exercise eminent domain and kick people out of their fields. I'm not saying that's good, but it definitely enabled the development of that network. But there's another factor in its favor. Flying in China sucks. Its airports are consistently ranked the worst in the world for punctuality. With the planes, I was used to delays of up to five, six, even seven hours. I got back in Beijing at four zero in the morning when I was supposed to be home like about 10 and zero or 11 zero. He can thank the military for that. It controls roughly three quarters of China's airspace. So that means commercial flights have to wait until the army gives the go ahead for takeoff. And guess who that S good for? The rails have basically outcompeted the airline companies. For example, between Eastern China to Central China, those were routes which were very big with the airlines. Before high speed came in, 
The railways have been able to attract so many more customers that flights have pretty much ceased between these metropolitan pairs. Building all of this is carbon intensive, but all in all, China's push for rail still greatly reduces its long-term footprint. And for the world's biggest CO2 emitter, that's a big payoff for the planet. But China's story is nowhere near the end. The country is aiming to double its high-speed network by 2035, taking it to 70,000 km of tracks. As if that weren't enough, the government recently made a big splash around the rollout of its fastest Magla train. You heard that, right? Magnetic levitation, which goes up to 600 km. It's the world's fastest land vehicle. The financial disaster of the Chinese realm network is also a hard sell to Western governments, many of whom already have financial concerns, to deal with without going into debt to the tune of trillions for a rail network. Furthermore, the lack of enthusiasm among Chinese riders is a concern for the future of rail in America and similar places that are looking to build theirs. Out as it is a signal that even if the government does go to the extremes to build out their whole network themselves, ridership may not be what is expected. Regardless, however, it is undeniable that even with those major issues, it is still a project that is heavily impressive in terms of speed and scale. Let me know what you think down in the comments and stay subscribed for the next few weeks when we're going to look at some of the European models and how those can be WF's app replicated or discarded in the future as we look towards expanding infrastructure around the world. Land vehicle. The financial disaster of the Chinese realm network is also a hard sell to Western governments, many of whom already have financial concerns, to deal with without going into debt to the tune of trillions for a rail network. Furthermore, the lack of enthusiasm among Chinese riders is a concern for the future of rail in America and similar places that are looking to build theirs. Out as it is a signal that even if the government does go to the extremes to build out their whole network themselves, ridership may not be what is expected. Regardless, however, it is undeniable that even with those major issues, it is still a project that is heavily impressive in terms of speed and scale. Let me know what you think down in the comments and stay subscribed for the next few weeks when we're going to look at some of the European models and how those can be WF's act replicated or discarded in the future as we look towards expanding infrastructure around the world. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more future updates. Thanks for watching.